I was such a shitty person for 12 years of my life. You know, I did a lot of bad things. I'm just maxed out. How do you break up with your best friend? Just getting someone to come help you. Right. It seems like a challenge. Right. I don't know how to integrate an employee. I have no clue how to do it. Everything kind of was going You can always do a little bit more. I have a lot of negative karma to counterbalance. Whenever you're saying yes to something, you have to say no to something else. In my head, I'm like, I don't trust any of this stuff. I've been doing this all on my own. Just gotta figure out a path forward. Today we're in Vermont with Zach from Music Mountain Compost, where last year he made $187,000 picking up people's food scraps. But he's not been able to get an employee, keep them, and grow the business. Let's see if we can turn this thing around. This is like where every like old Hallmark movie is made. Out in the sticks. Oh, we have arrived. Good to see ya. Good to see ya. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Absolutely, man. This is this is epic. Hey Mike, uh, my name is Zach Pockets. I own Music Mountain Compost based out of Vermont. So currently I have about 600 customers and I go around you know, curbside for uh, food scraps. I go all over the state of Vermont picking up. Uh, so currently I don't have any employees. I got a couple helpers. Uh, that's been one of the issues is like trying to find a good helper that'll stick around. So basically, yeah, I pick up these bins of food okay. uh, from schools, jails, churches, apartment buildings, and then I also do residential. So then I bring it all up here, uh, dump it out, I mix it in with like straw, wood chips, manure, and then I bring it out into the field, like right down here. Like that, that pile at the end there, that's probably two months old, and it's been some raw food scraps to uh, pretty much soil. And in another month or two, it'll be ready to sell. So that's like the other part of the business is like, uh, there's the pickup part, but then there's also like selling it out there. The basic premise of Music Mountain composting is that you pick up people's food scraps, you then compost that material and then sell the dirt to gardeners and other landscapers. The question is, can this really be profitable? And is there enough demand to actually grow the business? I'm just maxed out, you know, right. I'm getting to be maxed out and I've been doing this all on my own. So the pickup part is like 12, 14 hour days and I've had a helper a few times they never last more than a couple months. And I pay them good, I start them at $25 an hour, but they don't stick around. I have 572 customers right now, and I pick enough for every single one by myself. Like when I started, I was like, when I hit 300, I'm gonna hire someone. You know, when right. I hit 400, I'm gonna hire someone. And then I got to 400, I'd be like, oh, I'll be all right. And I got to 500, and then it was like, I don't know how to integrate an employee. Yep. You know, I have no clue how to do it. 572 customers all by himself? That's amazing. But I do wonder if potentially his lack of organization is why he hasn't been able to get an employee to stick around. Just getting someone to come help you. Right, <laughs> right. Like this is my every other Monday, and this is the only day during the week that I don't have a route. Okay. The opposite Monday I do. And I've kind of left this day open as like, I'll come up, work on the tractor, do the, the maintenance on the piles, stuff like that, and have like a little bit of time at home. And so I can still add a route on this day. Mm -hmm. And then a few of the other routes, like I can, I definitely have room to add. It's a lot of logistics. Yeah, You know, like there's a couple of routes where it's like basically a hundred stops in a day. Most of your contracts now, is it commercial from the volume perspective? like? Is it like 80% in terms of the volume coming from commercial and like municipalities, schools, et cetera, and then 20% volume coming from residential? Probably 50-50. From a revenue perspective, 50-50, or from a yeah, volume so perspective? I make, the business probably brings in 16 to 18,000 a month. I'd say eight grand of that is commercial. Got it. But the commercial accounts, I only have 62 of them. Okay. Um, and I have 510 residential. That's why I'm trying to, I've been working on the commercial side of things to beef that up because there's more money in it. Totally. I mean, I charge $25 per one of these bins. And then I charge for a house, a five gallon bucket empty twice a month, $22. So probably 20% have a second bucket. Um, and then I charge them 27. Okay. So every time they need a, another bucket, it's another five bucks. But the bulk of the money is, is definitely commercial. Why wouldn't a homeowner just throw the scraps away. Yeah, that's very true, and a lot of them do. I've kind of banked on people not being able to do it at home, but still want to do the right thing. So $25 would be this cost, yep. a five gallon bucket every other week, it's gonna be 22 bucks yep. for residential. Yep. So basically a residential customer, you're getting about 50 bucks a month. Then we got about 60, 70 customers that are commercial yep. and they're probably more a hundred, $150 per month. The cheapest is 50. You know, they'll go every other week, one bin. The most I have is 800 to 900. Well, that's a jail. And then I got a school district and that's about yeah, eight, 900 bucks a month. I imagine there's not a lot of churn. Like once people are with you, they just stay with you. Most of the time, yeah. I mean, occasionally like I'll have a customer from the beginning cancel. And like, that's the other part of this. I get them ahead about it. 
what did I do wrong? Like, why did they cancel after three years, you know? But my retention's pretty good. Yeah. It's just, uh, I feel like when someone does cancel, I kind of, I let it weigh me down more than it should, you know? And I just, I'm so attached to these people, you know? And like, I never thought like that would be like my biggest issue, but everyone that signs up, I care about them so much, you know? Like, and maybe it's like to my own detriment, but like I want them to have like the best service possible because they're putting faith in me by signing up. So basically, I think it all stems from like, when, you know, like I said, I was a drug addict for 12 years, from 12 to 24, and like my reputation was shot. Nobody liked me. No one wanted to be around me. Um, no one trusted a word I ever said. And so these last 10 years, I really hit the ground running with, like I mentioned, volunteering with my local town, like doing everything I can to help people. Now that I've built up my reputation again, I protect it, I think at all costs. I'm really focused on like trying to help people while also like growing a successful business for myself. And just like, I think they both matter to me just as much and that might be my issue sometimes, you know? I wasn't a businessman before this. When I jumped into this, I was unemployed. I just gotten fired from like my dream job at a rehab facility and uh, everything kind of was going to shit. Now it's during COVID, right? During COVID, the beginning of COVID, yeah. yeah. I got this great job because I've been recovering myself and so I wanted to work with other people and then COVID hit and they fired a bunch of people. Um, so I was just home sitting there for three months. So I was a recovery tech, uh, is what the title was. I had an office off the living room in the rehab facility, and if people needed something, I was there. I got really disillusioned with the thought that uh, we were trying to help people. We weren't really helping people. We were just trying to keep enough people there to keep the lights on. If we had 25 people, which is a full house, and like we did a room search and we caught you with drugs, we would kick you right out. Now, if we had 14 people, which is like the minimum amount of people we need in there, and we caught you with drugs, we would phrase it like we were giving you another chance uh, and we would let them stay. But really it was because we needed so many people there to be able to pay everybody. We'd kick people out sometimes, I'd have to drive them to the bus stop in town. And I remember very clearly, it still haunts me. This poor girl got caught with a pot pipe. It was like 10 o'clock at night in a snowstorm and she's from like two hours south of there. No cell phone, no money. And I had to drive her to the bus stop at 10 p.m. Um, and leave her there. And she's crying the whole way because she's got nowhere to go. She's got nowhere to be, uh, no way to get home, um, and I'm just doing my job, doing what they told me to do, and it just they wrecked me, you know? Like, I, I care way too much about people uh, to put people in those positions. I saw a thing on the news, like, oh, next week they're starting this food scrap law in Vermont. And so I thought about it for a couple hours, and I did a little bit of research, and I saw other people doing it in other states. Yeah. And so I told my wife, I was like, I'm just gonna try it, and I bought a trailer. I had like five grand, I bought a trailer and a bunch huh. of buckets, and I just started advertising. That's awesome, dude. You know, and I got to like 200 customers within the first month. How'd you get 200 time. customers that fast? Like, Honestly, people just talking to each other? No, like, no. Um, Facebook so groups? Or? I got lucky. Uh, there's a WCAX, which is the news in Vermont. Yep. Um, I emailed them, I emailed all the local newspapers, and I got a couple of them to pick it up and do a story about it. Music Mountain Compost is anything but a side gig. It exceeded my expectations. I mean, I have a little over 300 customers. Um, and that's just in the first 12 months, just by myself, just trying to grind it out and make a bigger business out of it. Between that and honestly, Facebook garage sale pages? Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Honestly, like they're a free post, everyone sees it. And honestly, majority of it, probably 80% in the beginning came from Facebook garage sale posts. Wow. Do you have a website? Yeah. Okay, I, I need to look at that. Cause like one thing I, I, I was thinking about, cause it's such a low ticket item, like per month, you know, you're looking at 50 bucks, yeah. right? It's tough to even have a marketing spend in terms of acquiring customers. But I think that if you can get people there and signing up immediately and you get their payment information and it's just like automatically put into right. the system, right. it's like, hey, we just need your address, put your card information in and like we'll be there next week. Right. That way it's just like super seamless. Otherwise, okay. it's just so much time and energy just trying to get set up someone up for 50 bucks a month. Right. It's tough. So basically, yeah, I mean, I spend about eight grand a year on advertising. Yeah. And that's you know, online and then radio, mailers. I've kind of given up on the mailers, yep. you know, like they don't really work anymore. I mean, honestly, online's probably the best one, Google Ads. I made sure like right off the rip, someone told me like, if you got over, I think it was like 15 or 20 reviews, Google will start pushing your ad up the listing. And so I really focus hard on that. I'm up to like 39 reviews, I think. Cool. And uh, when you Google composting Vermont, I'm like right there. And that's really like what I wanted. Kudos for Zach for getting the Google reviews. That's going to help him be able to be visible on Google search when people are looking for anything to do with composting. However, I really think that once they get to the website, he could absolutely get more customers just by making sure that they don't have to email him just to get more information or email him to get pricing. He's just copying and pasting the same exact email back to them. Why not have a form where they fill out their information at the end, he gets their card and they're a customer. So right now, like 
So 2023, we had 180,000 approximately in revenue. 187. Profit wise, we're running like 90 take home, but like 130 gross profit, is that where we're at? For 2023, it was 187 and I'll, I'll make uh, about 100, it was like 128. Got it. And then right now, in terms of like cash in the bank or around usually 15 to 20K. Yeah, typically about 15 to 20K. Have you raised prices in the past few years at all? <laughs> yeah, um, I raised uh, $2 a month. So I went from 20 to 22. Um, wow. I know, but, I know, Mike, but listen, to, okay, so you should, like I said, you should really talk to my wife. Uh, it was right when gas prices were going back up and we were almost at $4 a gallon and I was talking to my wife and I was just like, what do I do, you know? And she's like, you're gonna need to raise your prices. And I was and she's like, oh, 24, you know, raise it four bucks or whatever. And I'm like, you know, I don't know, I don't know. And so I kind of sat on it for like four months. And then finally I was like, I need to do something. In my head, I was like, $2. <laughs> and I was like, no one's gonna quit over two dollars, you know. And um, sure enough, like I didn't lose a single person and be like, oh, you raised the prices, like I'm done. So it was like an extra twelve hundred dollars a month because I wasn't trying to like get greedy with it. I really just wanted to make up for the rise in the gas cost. And so yeah, I just I went up two dollars. It, it was dumb. Probably I should have done more. I get told all the time that like I'm underselling my service, yeah. but they all I'm hearing it from people that don't own a composting business, so like they have no, yeah. they have no frame of reference. I mean, everything you said, I'm gonna try to do. Um, I think the price increase will be the most difficult thing, just because I'm so attached to everybody. Well, the thing is, if if you're getting current customers, like if you raise prices on let's say four or five hundred people, right. and not a single person left, yeah. Like that's enough to tell us that, <laughs> hey, we're undercharging. Right, right. And and really like all the problems that we're having right now can be solved with money. Like right. the tractor, moving the stuff over, getting the new screener, you know, even hiring. It's like if you hire, if you were able to pay someone enough money, right. eventually they'd stay. Well, that's where I have a, a moral issue because like I feel like I'm making a lot of money already. Yeah. You know, like the, there's not a lot of overhead. And so I kind of just feel like why be greedy? Well, what's, what's the objective of the business? Make a lot of money. And what for? Like, what's the objective of making more money? Oh, I mean, set my family up. I want us to have a great life. and have everything we need and um, I want my wife to be able to stop working by next year so she can just focus on the kids. That's like the ultimate goal. Doesn't sound greedy to me. Making more money is not more greedy. Right. The right. objective of the money is to do a lot of very good things. Yep. No, it's true. And the fact that not a single customer left means that they see the value right. far above what you see it as. Right, right. So I guess where I get like concerned about something like that is like this past month I had seven cancellations. Yeah. So in my head, I'm like, I start spiraling up. like, oh my God, like the world's over. Um, what, one what do I do? One percent I know, turn. I know, but in my head, it's, it's, it seems very substantial in my head. Right. Well, even what you could do is, is this. So you're like, hey, I have a moral problem with raising my price and making more money. God forbid. <laughs> Anything over 550 customers, yeah. we're going to be charging this higher rate. Okay. And then what's going to happen is we need to actually raise price and lose customers because we can't keep doing the work yourself. And I know it's like, well, I can add I one more. I can add, <laughs> I can add two more. I can add maybe four more. But it's like, where do we draw the line between like, you're eventually just going to be working 16 hours a day. Yeah, I mean. And know, then the whole reason for definitely. the business is for the family. And now right. we can't see them. Like now that's stupid. I'd hate the thought of like losing. Like, cause Mike's like, oh, you want to lose customers. And like in my head, I'm like, no, I don't. Do we make more money is not a matter of we're trying to be greedy. It's like, we will create another job. We'll be able to service twice as many customers. And if we're trying to like do good in terms of the food waste issues, et cetera, it's like we will be able to double output if we raise prices. I think what I would do is like set your capacity. The problem I see with you and same thing as me, with me, you can always do a little bit more. Right. Like, and if a customer calls like, yes, I'll do it. Right. Like you're gonna get to 700 and you're gonna be like, oh, I can try to do a couple <laughs> more, right? So it's like, we need to set what that benchmark is. Okay. In my opinion, that should be probably like 550 or 600. Well, I'm at 572 right now. So, okay, so I think 550 is the number. It's like anything over 500, we either A, raising prices, or B, we have to increase capacity with more another truck and more employees. Okay. And, and, two, yeah. and if, we're, if we raise prices tomorrow by, let's say, four bucks, and we, we are still above 550, I would be like, raise them again. Right. If you've seen it on the channel before, hit capacity, raise prices. If you're not trying to grow, guess what happens? You hit capacity and you raise prices. Let's say it together. Hit capacity, raise prices. I'm pretty maxed out because on top of this, I'm on my town select board. I'm on my local search and rescue. I was just on my fire department for three years. I just got off that. And yet you're telling me you can increase the number of customers you have yeah. by 15% right. more right. going to 700. Yeah. I'm always like looking for more, you know, and like trying to figure out how to do things more effectively. But I'm also not afraid to give up my time. Well, and especially as you begin to scale and going past your time, like 
you can, you only have 24 hours in a day. And what you're gonna end up hitting up against is like you will run out of hours in the day. Oh, yeah. So now, now yeah. you're giving off Saturdays, yep. right? Yep. Which is time that otherwise would go towards the whole objective of this business, which is time with family. Right. Why do that if I can go raise prices and in a month make that much yeah. in profit? That's my problem, honestly, is I just like, I, I, care, I care too much about things. But I also have to look out for myself at the same time. I mean, everything I do is for, for my family. I have a really hard time with slowing down. Whenever you're saying yes to something, you you have to say no to something else because you have a finite number of hours I'm in a day. I'm always saying yes to everything. You and, know? and as you begin to grow the business, the saying yes to more things is yeah. actually gonna keep you from growing. Right. So I'm working on getting rid of some things because like I'm also the animal control officer in my town. <laughs> I'm the emergency management coordinator. And there's like five other little things I do for the town. I've been working on paring things down, but my problem is always but I, I can't sit still and it just have to like go, go, go. And it's at my own detriment. And I think it, it, it affects the business because I'm not able to fully concentrate on it because I'm like so spread thin. Although I commend Zach for how involved he is in all aspects of his community, his family, and a bunch of different business ventures, I really believe that time and energy focused on one singular business will allow it to grow and give it the attention it needs. Potentially, maybe why he can't grow the business and he can't get employees is because his attention is split in all these different directions, although they are admirable and good things. So how much, how much of the revenue is pickup versus selling the soil after. So that's the thing, right? Uh, that's one of my problems. The pickup part is doing great, right? I make yeah. a ton of money, uh, the profit's great. But the soil part, I partnered with my best friend. That's Jake. Jake, yeah. Kent. It hasn't panned out for us the way we wanted it to. He just has no time. Kent. He's an engineer, he lives in Burlington, which is where he came from. Last year he was only down here in three days total. He told me he didn't have much time, and I said, oh, let's just do it anyway, uh, stupidly. He put in part of it for the tractor. I haven't really sold, you know, we sold probably three grand last year worth the soil. Yeah. And like, I could sell a ton more than that. My idea idea kind of is to split up with him and just do it on my own because he doesn't have the time commitment but I had to figure out like how do you break up with your best friend <laughs> without make, breaking up with yeah, your best friend I've known him 20 years how many yards of material do you think you make a year it's hard to say I mean, in the three years I've done it I've picked up over two million pounds of food we'd have to figure out the tractor thing because it's kind of a sneaky situation with that because like I said he put money in for it but we haven't made any money so when you go to break up, like how do you do that? Like what percentage of the rev or the business does he own? Or is it just well, like- We're 50-50 in the soil oh, side. Oh really? Okay, so 50-50 in the soil side, you own 100% of the collection side. Right. Which but, is where all the money is. Got it, so but last year it was only $3,000 on the soil side. Yeah. So there really wasn't anything to no, split. No, we spent money. Um, okay. We had to fix the tractor and like little things came up. And then like the other side of that is I have uh, the, the, the landowner, he'll do some tractor work for me sometimes when I'm too busy. And when we get the bill every three months, I've just been paying it myself because I have the money. But really, like, should the soil business be paying half the bill? It's gotten very muddled. Well, right now, it's only making up 2% of the revenue. But there's a lot of money to be made in it. Because I sell in 50 pound bags and buy the yard. What do you sell that per yard? $100 a yard. Do you think you make like a couple hundred yards per year? Probably closer to 800 or 1,000. So for Jake, your partner, have you talked about at all about him kind of leaving the business? No. We're really good at not talking about stuff together. Um, <laughs> you know, like we're just, when we get together, we don't see each other often, so right. we usually just have a good time. From the soil perspective, he probably hasn't seen any distributions. He hasn't seen a single penny, no. So don't, don't you think he'd just be happy with his 10 grand back and him leaving that? So here's the other side of that, right? And maybe this is shitty of me, but I don't want that tractor. Like I don't. And so well, like how do to... I how do I figure that out? Well, how how much do you think you sell that tractor for? Like five grand? Yeah, we over you know, he overpaid for it. Got it. Quite a bit. It just seemed like in the moment that was like the best path forward. But in reality I should have just buckled down and figured it out on my own. And I'm not like a slave to it or like, you know, stuck with it. It's just like and it's like, again, I don't want to hurt him, you know? He's like one of my favorite people in this world. I would never want to do anything to to hurt him in any any way. You know, like I'd take a bullet for him. So like that's another part I'm trying to figure out how to navigate. Cause I need a bigger tractor, so like why would I need his? But I don't want him to feel like I'm just leaving him with a tractor he's never gonna use. But did he get the tractor and, and like the ten the ten grand for the sake of the fifty percent of the soil business? No, no. Oh really? I just made him a partner. I was just like, Hey, you wanna be a partner in the soil business? And he was like, Yeah. And I was like, Alright. And then we didn't even 
I don't even know if we have a contract signed. If you're gonna go into business with a friend, I understand there's a lot of advantages because you've already built up a rapport and have a good relationship with them. Just keep in mind, it's also very important to communicate, have contracts, and have clear expectations of what that partnership's going to look like. Otherwise, the friendship and the relationship you've built up with them could potentially come into jeopardy. Do you were raised in this park? No, I, was, I grew up in Rutland, which is like a half hour that way. Okay. My wife grew up here. I've been over here 10 years now. Because when I met her, I mean, I was, I just got out of rehab. Because before that, I was 24 and I, I was living in my car. I lived in a gold Ford Explorer at a park and ride for two years. I'd been homeless on and off since I was 17. So it's, it's been a wild ride. And that's why, like now, like I don't have any education. So like with the business stuff, it was very intimidating. And I've kind of just been figuring out as I go. You just gotta do it, man. I mean, especially with the recoveries or, you know, using, you just gotta rip the bandaid off, you know? Like you're gonna go through withdrawal. It's gonna suck for a little while. You're gonna have to rebuild your life and relationships. And it's gonna take a ton of work. It's gonna take all your time. And it's the same thing with business, really. I looked at starting the business, same thing as going into recovery because they're both really hard and you're really out of place and you kind of just flounder and clueless and just figuring it out as you go. And honestly, like, Business and getting sober, they're very similar things in my eyes. How do you do your routing for all the pickups? Honestly, I just figured it out. I know there's like apps that customize the route, route yeah. but I just figured it out. I had 20 people on the route to begin with, and I just figured out by trial and error the quickest way to get to them, and then just branch it off of that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty good at just doing it in my head, but I know I can't do that forever. And for the employees, <laughs> yeah, right? Because they, they're going to spend 20 minutes driving out to a place, come 20 minutes back and realize, oh, there's, the next stop is like, two minutes from my last stop. Exactly. So you're yeah. gonna have to find something to route. Like an app? Anything, like whether or not, like, if, so for example, you could use Copilot, like that's the software we use. Okay. Where you basically you put all the customers in, you set them up for recurring service every week or every two weeks or whatever. It's gonna create, you know, a list of probably 100 people a day. You click a button to optimize the route, you give that to a, a, an employee on their app and they just oh. go from one to the next to the next to the next. At the very least, though, you gotta have something to route them because otherwise a crew member will literally hop in this truck and be 50% less efficient than you simply because they won't know the route. What's a service like that cost? It just depends on what, you know, what you're needing, but anywhere between like 100 to 300 bucks. A month? A month. But, but it is literally a requirement if you have an employee from a routing perspective, especially this many stops a week. Yeah. Like just guarantee that someone will be 25% less efficient than you yeah. simply because of the routing. Especially because it's not in order, you know, and, and it's just on a piece of sheet of paper in like 12 size font. How would they figure out where to go? Well, you'd probably have pages. Like you'd probably have 100 stops in a day sometimes, right? Yeah, yeah. It's usually about, it's usually between 80 to 100 stops a day. Technology and software can absolutely help you be more profitable by optimizing your business. Whether it be trying to optimize a route or optimize your pricing, using software can absolutely give you an edge above the competition. And if you just say, I'm not techie, I, I can't figure it out, someone else is gonna figure it out and they could potentially pass you by. I, if I was you, honestly, from a branding perspective, if you're trying to build a big, big business, I would do a weird color. So like, if you were saying, okay, Music Mountain, I would do something like, okay, it's gonna be a white bucket, but it's gonna have a music note on the side or something, okay. or better yet, do like pink bucket, or like weird color, okay. green, green. So that way it's like identifiable, and then people start to be like, hey, what, what are the green buckets in your, on your port? And then people are able to tell a story. And you, you don't think the orange ones are good for that? Well, you could do it for now, right? But everyone identifies that with Home Depot, right? Yeah, that's what sucks, you know? But they're just, they, they're the cheapest bucket. They're cheap, yeah. Like, I, I don't think for now people are gonna leave your service over that. No. When you start talking about branding, where people are coming to you all the time, things like painting your truck the same color as the bucket is an important uh, thing. Okay, so probably like a, an eco color, like green or blue or... You could, or just making it weird to where people are like, what is that? Besides, oh, it's a Home Depot bucket. Exactly, if you do like a light blue bucket and then your truck shows up and it's all light blue, stuff like that, okay. you know. When it comes to branding and marketing, we wanna create a brand that people remember and is memorable. And to do that, sometimes you gotta stick out a little bit, whether it be having pink buckets or in the case of Augusta, we have yellow trucks. People don't remember the name Music Mountain Compost. They don't remember Augusta Lawn Care Services. For Augusta, they're gonna remember yellow trucks with a big dog on it. And that's what we're gonna be memorable for. And so Music Mountain can have pink buckets or some other way of getting creative with sticking inside the mind of the customer. I also think like for now, that's not like the lowest hanging fruit. Like the lowest hanging fruit is like raise prices to yeah. increase profits. Okay. Two, it is change the website to so improve the amount of leads coming in. I literally think you could double the amount of leads you get every month by just making that a form instead of an email. Okay. 
And then third is like getting software to make when you have an employee, make yeah. them efficient. Honestly, when I showed up in Vermont, I wasn't expecting that food scraps could make a hundred thousand, let alone million dollar business for Zach. However, after seeing the operation, I think with a little tuning up, this could easily become a seven figure business that is extremely profitable and can provide more jobs in the local community. So I got somebody helping me out um, a little bit with the routes, but mainly up at the site, which is what I really needed. I need someone to like manage the piles um, and, you know, make sure everything's covered, clean up um, and do all the tractor work that I can't do. That was more important to me, uh, but I did hire someone right after um, you guys came and it's going pretty well. You know, I don't know how long, long term wise it'll work out, but you know, I'm feeling hopeful. I'll say that. As far as branding goes, I, I got two people now going out and like uh, going out to restaurants and businesses, trying to get them to sign up for the service. Um, I just added a second guy um, this past week. And so that's really what I've been focusing on because I want to bump up the commercial side of things. Um, so I got two people going out and then I'm actually taking a page out of Mike's book and doing um, door hangers. You know, I, I printed 200 of them um, and when I distribute them, if I get a bunch of angry calls, I'm not going to do it again. But if I don't get any angry calls, I'll just keep doing it until I do, you know. People really value their privacy privacy out here, you know? We don't have anything in writing, really, um, which might be not, probably not the best uh, route to take, but um, we had a really great conversation. Um, I kind of put it off for a few weeks, and then my wife really gave me a kick in the ass one night. It was like, you know, he deserves to know. You need to talk to him about it, blah, blah. Um, and he was feeling the same way, but he didn't know how to bring it up either. So it was a good, like, it was good that I did it when I did because we both got to say what we wanted to say. And, you know, we've kind of, we've come to a, a pretty good conclusion of how this will end. Um, be going our separate ways and still being best friends, which is all I really cared about to begin with, you know? I don't want to lose my best friends. So, you know, it, it, it broke my heart even thinking that that could happen, but I'm glad we had averted such a thing. I did not raise prices yet. I'm going to do it at the end of the year on January 1st. I figure it gives me time to like mentally prepare for it. And then I'm, I'm going to raise it, you know, I mean, maybe a dollar, maybe two dollars. I don't know. I still don't know how I feel about that. I'm still soul searching. I don't like change very much. So I'm currently, uh, I mean, like I said, change is hard for me, um, but I am, I'm adding this coming month is people will be able to pay with a card and have a card on file. It'll cut down on receivables. Not that that was really a problem, but it'll streamline things a little bit, make it a little easier for me. <laughs> then the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, figure out a route automation uh, software to help optimize like the routes because like I've done a good job with it but um, I'm sure I know it could be a little more streamlined and then the big thing I want to add as well and I've, and I've done a lot of research on it is uh, email notifications and it for pickup um, and you know and I'm probably going to be looking into some of the bike software for that um, but basically it would just be an email where they would get it the night before um, their pickup because sometimes people forget to put their bucket out and then I have to leave another bucket and then the next time there's two buckets and so it kind of snowballs sometimes so if people can have reminders i feel like it would help retention a little bit because sometimes people they'll forget to put the bucket out for a few pickups and they're like oh i can't remember uh i'm gonna cancel um so i feel like it'll cut down on those types of cancellations as well Um, I did step down from the select board, which is, uh, it was a three year term, um, and I chose not to not to run again. And besides that, I mean, I'm still doing everything that I was doing. I haven't taken anything on. I'm kind of like, kind of being really careful about that because I need more time at home with my family. And so I've kind of been, if anything, I've been decreasing my extra things that I do a little bit, just to try to have a little bit more time at home. You know, I hike a lot in the summer, um, so I want to do that a little more this year and play on a softball team. So I want to do, you know, I want to focus on that too. And four wheel and motorcycle and all my fun stuff. So I want to make sure I got plenty of time to do that and hang out with the kids, you know. So I've kind of like pumped the brakes a tiny bit. When the time's right, I'll get back involved with all the other stuff. I still have like six positions in my town, but uh, slowly cutting it down a tiny bit. I got my truck back because, you know, I had some issues. The, the new truck I bought. Uh, I got my truck back and I'm just just running the route, hanging out, trying to keep my head above water and enjoying it while I do it. <laughs>